Hi, everyone. I'd like to welcome you today to Ask the Alboy Academy's Demystifying Credentials and Access Control. My name is Guy Robinson, and I will be your virtual instructor today. As you can see, there is a, uh, on your toolbar, there's a question and answer uh, tab. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask a question on the Q&A tab, and I'll either answer it immediately, or when I get to a stopping point, I will be able to answer your question. If you think of something later, I'm going to I'm going to put in. Uh, I've got to wait. I've got to wait for a question to be answered. Before, let me type. Um, I'm going to. Uh, my email address is guy dot robinson at asaabloy dot com. That's g u y dot r o b i n s o n at asaabloy dot com. Now, at the, the learning objective today is uh, we'd like for, at the end of today's session, you'll be able to just define or have a just a cursory understanding. It takes a lot longer than an hour to really be able to define a product, but a cursory understanding of the different type of access control products. I want you to be able to characterize the type of opening and hopefully you'll be able to say, hey, this access control product would be most efficient for this opening and you'll be able to justify your decision also hopefully you'll be able to do a rough uh, uh physical access control system for a building not install it but just have an overview if you're looking at a building or oh, what i'd like to put here here and here uh or what we go at a different place i always show this screen because this represents everything that ASA Abloy manufactures. ASA Abloy, the world's largest manufacturers of locks, doors, and access control. And I always put this on the screen because I, I generally don't know what type of business each individual is in. Um, you may be in a type of business where you don't, where you just deal in certain segments. But I always like to show this because it, this shows what encompasses the security of an opening and you can see electric strikes and door closers that make sure the door gets shut uh we have the hollow metal we uh, hollow metal frames hollow metal doors uh exit devices mortise locks keypads power supplies uh the flat goods for the doors patent control cylinders and keys now one thing about the lock door industry is i've been in the industry for over 45 years now just from talking to even old timers when i was in the industry the, this industry went along pretty boring you could say for a couple of hundred years i mean almost a couple hundred years i mean a lock is a lock a door is a door a hinge is a hinge same pin tumbler cylinder that you Rekey today is the same pin tumbler cylinder that Minus Yale patented in, eight, in the 1890s. Now we have, granted, we have different nuances in the very in the different uh, items I just mentioned, but pretty much they remain the same. However, in the last 15 years, we've had monumental changes in this industry. We have power over Ethernet locks. We have Wi-Fi locks that locks that pull down an IP address. We have networked access control. We have wireless access control. We have cylinders and keys that are electronic. Every time I put a key into the cylinder, it leaves an audit trail every time in the cylinder and in the key. And th these advances are coming fast and furious because the threats to the security of an opening are coming just as fast and furious. So what happens is when you have to keep making changes and putting new products on the market at a, at a faster and faster rate, it leaves a glitch in the marketplace of who knows how to work on them, who knows how to sell them, who knows how to install them. And you may have experienced this. And for that reason, we created Asa Abloy Academy of Americas. And that's what this class is part of. Also, 
logging on to Ask the App Boy Academy, you will see many additional classes that you can take. Most of them are an hour long. We have some longer ones. And to increase your knowledge in the different aspects of whether it's just a hinge or whether it's advanced access control, you would like to learn more about. Now, pretty soon, everybody realized that for the past year and a half, we've been uh, really almost virtually shut down uh, from instructor-led training classes. But as soon as this is all opening up again, we are gonna start doing instructor-led training classes again if you need more information. Now, let's get started on just demystifying a little bit of credentials and access control. Uh, actually, credentials, the reason why I include credentials in it is cre credentials is one of the least understood aspects of the door and hardware industry. So we're gonna take a look at, we're gonna take a look at this and the best way to, I find to fully understand is to, to understand access control is to look at our security continuum uh, where granted mechanical cylinder and keys is the least amount of security but it's also the least amount of money mechanical cylinders and keys give a level of security it keeps the door shut however if somebody would find but if somebody would find the key the key works 24 7. Uh, as I said earlier, that same, virtually that same pin tumbler cylinder that you're locking your door with has been locking doors since the mid 1800s. And this has left a large number of challenges over the course of, the, of years with pin tumbler cylinders. One of the challenges is the most secure your building will be after you're handed keys to it is the day you're handed the new keys. Now, through unauthorized key duplication, through lost keys, through individuals lending their keys out, the security of a new system starts to erode over the course of time. And within a couple of years, you have very low security with a pin tumbler uh, key system. And the only way really to gain the security back is to rekey all the cylinders again, which you will have to keep repeating the course because the same thing happens over and over over the course of the life of the building. Now, another thing that was not prevalent years ago, which has just come out in the last few years, is the ability to scan keys with your phone. If somebody was going to make, years ago, if somebody was going to make an unauthorized duplication of your key, they at least had to get the key from you. They had to get a hold of it through either you lent it to them or they took it without your knowledge and ran and got duplicate keys made. Now, that's not even needed. All you have to do is accidentally leave your keys on your desk and somebody can walk by with their phone, scan your keys, and have almost every key on your key ring sitting on their desk in a couple of days. You didn't even know there was a possibility that somebody made unauthorized duplication of your keys, and now it is easier than ever. So. That is the challenges that come with just using pin tumbler cylinders to secure your opening. If we're going to move up the security continuum to the next step, we would have to look at the keypad lock. Over the course of years, the standalone keypad lock has gained popularity and it has really come down in price. So if you want to have some traffic control, if you want to have some control where, the, where you can walk up and just by the uh, touching a few codes, add or delete individuals, this gives you a form of convenience and it also gives you a form of security. It's not much more than a pin tumbler cylinder, but it's also not much more secure. It is, though, 
a bit more secure. Now, when we talk about keypad, just a keypad lock, excuse me, uh, uh, security on it on an opening, there's a couple of different types. There's unsecured electronics and secured electronics. If you look at this picture, the unsecured electronics, the DK12, it's actually a quite reasonably priced solution to gain access control, to put on an interior door, and gives you the convenience if you want to, don't want anyone to have a code anymore, you can actually, within a couple of minutes, type in your code, delete theirs, and it's all said and done. Or if you would like to give somebody a code or change a code, it's pretty easily done at the door where you don't have to call people out to do it. But there is a drawback to unsecured, what I call unsecured electronics, is because if I unscrewed it, even though it can have security screws on it, it can still be unscrewed, they unscrew it to the wall, you see all the decision is made in the back, and then you could easily jump the circuit and gain entrance. And no one would know that you did that. So there is a little bit, of, it gives a little bit more security, but maybe not full security. Secondly, we have what I call secured electronics. It's the DK16 for interior use, DK26 for exterior use. Both of these have been in existence a very long time and are very popular, in, especially in the locksmith community, because pretty much for the list price of around $250, you can put access control at an opening. They're double door controllers. And the reason why I call them secured electronics is because the controller that you see next to each keypad is mounted on the inside of the opening. So if I'm standing on the lock side of the opening and I try to take the keypad off to gain access, this is all I would see is wire going inside. There would be no way for me to manipulate the door opening like I could with the DK12. So granted, these are very have very limited means. Uh, there is no audit trail available with it. However, it does give you the convenience of being able to add or delete individuals without rekeying cylinders, and it's easy enough to give new codes. So that was that one step up the security continuum. Next up the security continuum, when you're, when you're looking at access control, this is going to be about mid-range. It is more expensive than mechanical and keypad. But we call this the offline access control. This type of access control can provide a host of features such as keypad and card credentials, time and date settings, and audit trail. You're able to have the door stay open at a certain time, lock at a certain time. However, if you would like to make these changes or audit who's been in the opening, you do have to visit the opening. That's why we call it offline. Getting the information off the lock is much like using a data transfer device. The data transfer device hooks to your computer. You tell it the lock what you want. You walk up to the lock. And by infrared, data, by infrared transmission, it goes to the data transfer device. You bring it back to the computer. A lot of people call this sneaker net. However, to save thousands of dollars in opening, you tell people, hey, when money's an object, but they still need they still need audit trail, they still need to be able to add and delete people. They they need dual credentialing, such as with cards, and money's an issue. You can talk about offline. A lot of times people they don't mind walking up to the door to uh, if it can save them some money.
excuse me, we call this, the next up, we call it examples of offline is this is called standalone. Standalone is exactly what it, all the, all the information is built into the device. It's programmable. Software is available to reside on a computer in a standalone fashion. And you can use your data transfer device to add or retrieve information. They're scalable from 100 or 2000 users. I can get keypad only. I can get, I can get proximity, which is 26 bit only proximity. We're going to learn what that is shortly. We can have keypad and prox or we, which is called dual credentialing, or we can get keypad proximity and radio frequency technology, which would be a radio frequency button that I would press that would engage the relay and release the lock. Now, when talking about offline security, this falls in uh, offline, offline plus, because there is remote programming available because we have Bluetooth keys that you can pair with your phone, but I'll explain that in a second. Uh, the keys, this is called click. It's a type of key that when you insert it in the lock, it leaves an audit trail of which key went into the lock. It leaves an audit trail in the key. So I'm able to audit the lock or the key. I can find out who's been in an opening or I can find out where someone has been putting their key. Because in the audit trail, it tells me if they were granted access or they were not granted access. Now, as you can see, it has a large head, which means there's electronics in the head of the key. There's no way to duplicate this key uh, because you cannot see what the electronics are. And you see that there's a mechanical portion to the key because there's a blade with cuts, meaning that it can be backwards compatible with mechanical cylinders. So we can have a mixture of mechanical and electronic cylinders. Each key holds a thousand events on a FIFO basis and has a, a capacity of 32 different schedules, meaning I can have it open some locks, Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays, nine to five, other locks, Tuesdays and Thursdays, two to four, and other locks, 24 seven. I can do that 32 different times and you can branch those off by keys and cylinders. Now, just to explain what these are, the black headed key is a standard operating key. That's generally the key you give to people. I go much more into depth than other presentations and we even have certification classes on this if you need, if you need it. Then if it's got a yellow head, that's for a control key to remove the, the large format interchangeable cores we make in this. The Bluetooth key is just that. I can change this by logging on to the software, by accessing the software with my telephone and connecting and getting the changes and programming the key from the Bluetooth on my telephone. This may be an option for you. There's many different things that you can do with this. And what makes a system work is the C key. This key allows you to uh, transfer information from lock to computer. This key will, you're not even able to access the system, the software without the proper key because each system is individually numbered. Each key has an individual number. Each cylinder has an individual number. With the C key, as you can see, the programmer plugs into the computer. I have to have the C key in. And to access the software, then I will put the operating key in the other side and tell the operating key which cylinders I want it to work, when I want it to work it, or just get an audit trail from the operating key. Each system, you're able to put 200 C keys per system meaning 
if I got multiple campuses and I have individuals or managers on multiple buildings and I only want them responsible for their area or their building, I can give them one of the sub C keys and partition off which cylinders and employees they are responsible for. However, you're always going to have one top C key. It's kind of like the Lord of the Rings. Many rings, but one ring to rule them all. Now, before we move on, you heard me say something a moment ago. I said 26-bit proximity. Many of you have, have heard this. Many of you have heard it in the industry. Uh, many of you have seen card access control before. Uh, well, that's what I'd like to explain right now, because this is actually one of the most least understood items in the door and hardware industry, because most cards, you look at it, they all look the same. Granted, a MagStripe card will have a MagStripe on it, but of the multiple technologies there are, the rest of the cards just to have some writing on it. So, and people, they just, card access is card access to them. They don't realize that there's levels of security with each type of card access. So, when we're talking about the first card access, we're talking about the MagStripe card, which was, as you can see, was invented in the late 50s, and it was actually invented by the baking industry. You see, MagStripe cards can be read by swipe or insertion. The reason why... They don't carry a lot of information on it, but the reason why we got away from it is A, they, if someone gets them, they can be easily altered and information can come off of them easily. However, keep this in mind, in order to make a change to MagStripe cards, in order to get information from them, I still must be, get them in my hand. Now, not a lot of people do use these anymore, but you still have facilities that do use them. A lot of dorms use them for the simple reason is when bought in bulk, sometimes you can get them for 10 cents a card. So they are quite inexpensive, but however, when we're talking about card access, the card itself is generally very low security because of the ease if somebody gets it of altering it. Well, another term you've heard in the access control industry is, is called Wigan card technology. We all heard this as Wigan compatible. Well, the Wigan, reason why it's called that is because the quote Wigan effect was really discovered after about 40 years of research by this gentleman, Dr. John Wigan. And the Wigan effect is a way to cause the magnetic fields of specially processed small diameter ferromagnetic wire to suddenly reverse. And this generates a sharp, uniform voltage pulse. And when embedded into a card, the wires are spaced out. So when you run it through the reader, like I'm gonna show you in a second, uh, if there is a wire, then when it is run through the reader, the wire reverses, causing it to be read as a one. If nothing is read, then it's run as read as, as zero. So do you see what's happening with cards? With cards, you're sending over binary information when you're running the card through the reader. Now, when the term 26-bit is because the initial cards had 26 pieces or 26 spaces, either the space had a piece of uh, ferromagnetic metal in it or it did not. Consequently, when I would run the card through, it would be read as a zero or a one. As you can see, the facility codes, if anyone has ordered cards, you have to order a facility code and the card number. The eight bits made the facility code. The next 16 bits were the card number. So, under each facility code numbered 001 through 256, 
you were able to have 65,535 cards under each facility code. Because if I ordered card number one, two, three, four, five under facility card code 150, if I ordered the same card number under facility code 152, the card would not work because it was a different facility code. Not all facility codes were available to the public because they kept some as much as they do with keyways that they restrict. They restricted some facility codes to sell them to high-end users. Now, like I said, the piece of metal had to reverse in the first Wigan 26-bit cards. This was much of a novelty when it first came out and started being made to the public. I remember it. Uh, they would submerge these things in fish tanks and run the cards through. It works in a fish tank, you know, a fish tank of water. It was, it was a, it was, it, at the time, this was a, this was a great advancement. Now, as you can see, the card had to touch the reader because the pieces of metal had to flip. Now, what came about after that was Wigan protocol cards, and instead of using pieces of metal, as you can see, it uses a wire coil, and instead of becoming a Wigan coil uh, card that had to slide through the reader and make contact, it is now a proximity, which means it just has to get close. Because the, the way this works is you have a coil, you have a capacitor, and you have an integrated circuit within it that bears the binary code. So when the card got close to the reader, the antenna in the car, uh, the antenna would receive a signal from the nearby reader, it would excite it, it would get excited, means it would get charged, then would charge the capacitor. And then once the capacitor's charged, it spits out the information. So my binary code is in the card. As soon as it gets close to the reader, it just spits out the information. That's all it does. And I'm gonna show you that in a second. Now, our first generation of readers by HID, you heard this term, proximity readers, and there was also Indala readers. Indala was basically proprietary, which means the card had to be programmed to that reader. There was a proprietary systems. The 26-bit readers and 26-bit cards, they would work on any proximity readers or with proximity cards. And this is exactly how it worked. Here we have the card with the binary code in it. You can't see it. Here you have the reader. The reader gets close. The, excuse me, the card gets close to the reader. Many of you have seen small readers and very large readers. The card remains the same. The reason why the readers get bigger and bigger and bigger because the bigger the reader, the more distance you can have from the be from the card. So when you see big readers like on by doors or uh, maybe elevators, that's generally because people are walking by with the card around their neck and they're generally carrying boxes. So so they don't have the inconvenience of having to get like real close. They can just get close to the reader and the reader's large enough to excite the card and receive the binary code. So. The card gets close to the reader. The reader sends the energy to the card. The card sends over the binary code. The binary code goes to the controller. And what happens? It's binary. It makes a decision. Yes, you can come in. No, you can't come in. That's binary. Yes, you can come in. No, you can't come in. Either that code says you can, is that either that code matches with your name and you're allowed to come in, or that code does not match that you're allowed to come in this opening, bottom line. So as you can see, the reason this existed uh, 
is because this enabled people to add and delete people at will with the press of a button on a computer. They could audit the opening in seconds. Everything could be done quickly from someone's office within seconds with the press of a button on a computer. If you're wondering what HID meant, HID actually was a division of the Howard Hughes Corporation. It was called Hughes Identification Devices. And it was a what they invented to, since they were working on so many government projects, it was what they invented to control their engineers from going from, from going from different projects to different projects because everything was so secret. And they sold it to another company who in turn sold it to ASA Abloy. Now, some of you may already see a problem with this. And the problem is once that card's excited, you have no way to stop the information from going. No way. So in that case, this has been hacked for a very long time. In fact, you can go on Amazon and buy this little handheld device. I have one. If someone has a prox card and they throw it on their desk, within a second, you can hit the read button. They don't even know you did it. Go to a generic uh, key fob that, or card that hasn't had anything printed on it and hit write. Now you can easily take their information, write it to something else. It's not, it's even worse than having a key because with a key, no one knows who got in the door. If they copy your card, they're now you. It looks like that card's registered to you and you're walking through all of these openings. That's why proximity, 26-bit proximity should never be used anymore. The least you should ever use on an opening, and even that's even better than this, but the least you should ever use on an opening is called iClass. iClass became the most secure credential ever made. In fact, all the credentials above it, even though they may have a different name, is a nuance of iClass. Let me explain. I-Class has different compartments in the card. They come in 2, 8, 16, 32, or 64K compartments. The price is also reflected in the more compartments. This is an advancement over proximity because the coil does not need to be copper. The coil can be printed ink on paper-like substrate that has an EPRAM when it stands for electrical erasable program of read only memory memory and is a type of non volatile memory that's used in computers. But another thing with the I class is you see the middle it's CSN. That's a card serial number. So before any information is sent over that card serial number must meet up with the reader because it's going to act like a password. I'm going to show you in a second. Now, iClass opened up a whole new level of opportunities because in each compartment, compartment 00 is always reserved for access control. But in compartment 01, that could be a thumbprint. So when I walk up to a biometrics reader, it can have dual credentialing. Present my card, present my thumbprint, and the reader reads the thumbprint that's on the card, it must match up with mine. Other compartments can have money, medical records, school grades, uh, different things to uh, different formats of going into uh, printers, many things, many applications can be put in the iClass compartments. Access control is just one of them. So now this opens up a whole new area for schools, for university, for government facility. And this is the way an iClass works. You notice the readers differently. It's got the straight line, multi-class reader going across the top. 
I still have the binary code in it. But when the card comes over and it gets energized, a series of passwords goes back and forth. Now, not until those passwords get made up, get matched, so it's a handshake, will the card release the binary code. However, it does release the binary code and the decision is made. Yes, you can come in. No, you can't come in. Now, before we go on to something, I want to explain a little bit about iClass SE. You're going to see this, but it was pretty much short-lived. It was, uh, it's still around. We still have it. But it was a stopgap measure because this is what happened. The top, the top card you'll see is COS. I'm going to explain that in a little bit. However, the iClass, HID learned that the iClass card was hacked. Granted. The iClass card has never been hacked in the field, but it was hacked in a laboratory. So once you know it's been hacked in a laboratory, you know there's a possibility it can be hacked. They weren't quite finished developing the CEO's card yet, which, which is an amazing credential. So they had to come up with a stopgap measure. And this stopgap measure was the iClass SE card, which is still in great use, SE, Secure Electronics card. And let me explain how it works. So we still have our reader and our card. Okay. Now, uh, now because, excuse me a second, the extra level of security that was added to this card was the SIO, the Secured Identity Object. Now with the secured identity object, you commonly call this a chip. And the CIO is a cryptographically protected data model for storage of secure identity data, such as a user ID. Now, take a look. We come over, see the SIO has the binary code built in. The card comes over, gets energized, back and forth still take place. This, it's open for the SIO to be sent over, the, the information be sent over, but now the software has to open it up to receive the binary code. Once it opens it up with the correct password, now the binary code is sent over. Okay, we're about to move on to the top credential, but I want but I want to make sure everybody understand understands this, and I, uh, so you can understand credentials. I know it's a little bit boring, and I know it's a little bit technical, but if you're going to be ordering these, there has to be an understanding of why you're ordering it. We just looked at proximity, which we know we shouldn't use because anybody can stand next to you with a reader. And if the reader is strong enough, they can grab your information. You don't even know they did it. Then we went to iClass and iClass SC. Now, granted, iClass SC is highly secure. No one has ever hacked it. Nor will they, you can't ever say never, but not in the near future will they ever hack it. So what was the need for a higher level of credential? Well, there was a need because if you notice with the iClass and the iClass SE, once I could get in, once the passcodes met up, I could see everything in that card. I could see the other compartments in the card. I could know there was other compartments in the card. Once I got past the security, I could see the other compartments. That's kind of a problem because that just lets somebody know there's other things on that card to be gotten. So the next thing we go to is CEOs. Now CEOs opened up a range of opportunities. CEOs supersedes legacy 
and existing credential technologies by providing the following. One, security. SEOS, S-E-O-S, has the best in-class cryptology offers. It offers unparalleled data and privacy protection, which gives the securest environment than any other credential. Again, next step, the two, the mobility of it. SEOS is software-based and independent of the underlying hardware chip. This provides new levels of form factor flexibility, including use on mobile devices, smart card, tags, and more. Three, the application can be extended well beyond access control, and it can be specifically tailored for enterprise, government, hospitals, K-12, universities, and more. Okay, you see something else that's inserted in the card. It does have an SIO, a secured identity object, but besides the SIO, the CEO's credentials main security is the CEO's core. The CEO's core is a secure vault that provides a consistent model for storing and using digital credentials. The vault is compartmentalized in multiple containers. Each container is referred to as an application dedicated file, an ADF. And each file has a unique object identifier. Each file has a unique SIO, which has to be used in order to access the information in that uh, container. So it comes up, all the authentication is passed back and forth. Then only one in order to see anything, they must have the software for that SIO. It comes over. Gets the binary code and it's sent over. Now, if the big difference of CEOs is this. Once you can see, you can't even see anything in that card, but with the software has allowed you to see that will release the SIO. You don't even know anything, cannot even know anything else exists in the card because the only thing you're gonna be able to see is the access control software, which makes it leaps and bounds above other credentials. Secondly, because the CO is a software-based credential technology, we just talked about the mobility, it is not tied to the underlying hardware chip. Modern credentials require an independence from the underlying hardware chip so that phones, cards, wearables, and other form factors can be used interchangeable as authentic, trusted credentials. The CO's card supports near field communication. It supports Bluetooth. It supports data on card. And because this is so, because it's a software based credential, if any other new credentials come out, that it, or any other, excuse me, not credential, if any other forms of communication come out, that is not known today. You don't have to replace your credentials. You can just get it added on. That's what makes CEOs so powerful. So as we look at it, the older technologies, uh, the vulnerabilities of the older technologies are to copy and cloning and hacking. However, with CEOs, you can't copy, clone, or hack. Also, it allows you to use other forms of communication for your access control. Next up, the security continuum, which is allowed by COs, oh, I should not say allowed, which is made available by COs, is data on card. And data on card is exactly how it sounds. 
In other access control applications, the computer board and the hardware or computer with software makes the decisions to allow or deny entrance to a facility or to an opening. In data or in card, the card tells the lock how to operate or it tells the opening how to operate. So that means if you're using this in multifamily situations, you can put battery operated locks where you do not have to run wire to the deadbolts or cylindrical lock on the door. Let me give you an example with data on card. Person comes in. The main entrance is connected to the cloud, uses their card. Now, it's against the law to lock someone out of their facility or their bed without due process. So changes are made to the card. The individual doesn't even know it. The individual goes, the individual goes up to their bed, their room, they can get in, but they want to go work out. They get their workout. Now, if somebody hasn't paid their rent, you can't lock them out of their bed, but you don't have to let them use anything else. Now, oh, I forgot to pay my rent. Goes down, pays the rent. The card is re-updated to work on everything. There's usually an update of right where they pay their rent. As you can see, this could be used in multifamily apartments, multifamily, uh, multi-campus businesses, where you have the, uh, the, uh, the reader that's connected to the cloud you only need a couple. All the other locks can just be battery operated, which saves a fortune on wiring. The next step up is wireless. Wireless technology is available in two types, Wi-Fi or Aperio versions. Wi-Fi pulls down an, I an IP address and Aperio wirelessly communicates with a hub that is wired back to the access control panel. While wireless technology has advantages, some of the disadvantages is that the hardware is not hardwired and some applications may not be instantaneous. However, stop the expense of wiring, the individual may not care if it's instantaneous. So we look at, at Wi-Fi and Aperio. Wi-Fi means all it works with a generic router and the software on the computer. You talk to the lock through a generic router. A period is a little bit different. A period is when you can't really get wires to the door. It's not cost effective. You can put the hub, if they already have an access control system, you can put the hub in the ceiling and it can speak to the lock. But the hub is actually wired to the access control panel. The hubs can come one to one ratio, or if you go through an OEM software company, you can get them in where one hub will work four locks, one hub will work eight locks, one hub will work 16 locks, as long as they're within 40 feet of the hub. These locks come in, as you see at the top, can come in mag stripe for many dorms for our campus solutions, proximity, keypad, proximity only, it comes in all the different types of lock sets, board, mortise, exits, rim, and also very highly aesthetically pleasing locks that is Bluetooth, NFC, CS compatible, uh, where it looks very uh, aesthetically pleasing on the door. Doc architects love this. And uh, the reader is multi-class, works with many of credentials. This is just an overview of the Wi-Fi. It speaks with, it speaks with the router. You have you program it to turn on a couple of times a day. You can't have it on all the time if you're just using batteries because the batteries will run out. Every time you present a card, though, it speaks to make sure there has been no changes. However, if the system would go down, it still holds the last 2,400 users, last 10,000 events. 
the Aperio. This is exactly what it looks like. The lock speaks with the hub. However, the hub is wired straight to the control panel. Aperio comes in the same type, uh, aesthetically pleasing lock sets. However, look at the Adams Wright G100 with Aperio. One of the hardest aspects of installing security on an all glass door with glass sides is where am I going to mount the reader? The glass doors usually have a header that I can put the, the mag lock on, but where am I gonna mount the reader? There's no place to screw anything or sometimes the glass doors don't have a header or something. So we had the Adam Fry G100 is a, a wraps around the glass door, wraps around the glass frame, and now I can have access control because this lock actually speaks to the hub that's mounted on the inside that is tied to the access control panel. Cabinet locks. You can have cabinets in a facility uh, and just maybe um, businesses have locker rooms medicine cabinets, anything, the, ca the cabinet locks, these locks will speak to the hub and everybody can use their access control card with it. You do not need to run wires to it. Now, online access control. This is the granddaddy of them all. It's the most expensive and rightly so. It is instantaneous everything instantaneous audit trail instantaneous addition and deletion instantaneous opening locking down opening uh releasing the openings whatever you need to do because everything is hardwired and that hardwired comes one of two ways either hardwiring the lock sets or power over ethernet as an example this is what a typical access control system look like. You have a reader, you have an electric strike, you have a lock on the door, you have a request to exit on the inside because that tells you when somebody's leaving, it's a legitimate opening because you have a DPS, a door position switch, because if somebody pries the door open, that sends a signal to the controller, it's an illegitimate opening. So this opening is covered. However, that's a lot of items that have to go on the opening. With the integrated Wigan solutions, Harmony by Sargent, as you can see, everything is built into the lock, reader, lock, electronic device, in solenoid and motor inside the lock. So all you have to do is put the lock on the door. You have an electronic powered lock, you have requests to exits on the on the levers. On the mortise, you have a door position switch, but if you're using something else, you'll have to add a door position switch. And it's one group of wires that run to the controller. Now, by only installing an aesthetically pleasing lock and running one set of wires, it's a much easier installation. It looks a whole lot nicer, and you get the same form of integrated access control. I want to thank everybody for your time today. If there is a question, I'll be on another minute or longer if there's questions. You can always reach me if you want more information on anything at guy.robinson at asaabloy.com.